Bill Powell is our guest. Bill never comes in empty-handed, and uh, these yeah. these are like fresh right out of the oven. Bill, what what are, what are these exactly? What did you bring us? Biscuits, both bacon and regular. My goodness, dude, this, this they smell, smell like... amazing. <laughs> Let me yeah. just say, Matt Miller and Bill Powell are in competition this morning. More hear... power to them. Like to have this every time. I hear That's... the new tutors might be hiring, so I'm, I'm <laughs> working on my craft. You, you might need a gig, you might not, and you never know. You got to be versatile. I'm told I bake better than most. I, I do most other things. So well, is... <laughs> I don't know. The bacon's pretty good, so you better be pretty darn good at everything else you do too. Before we get started, uh, Joe Ferretti uh, text earlier said Bill Powell's coming on. At, at the bottom of the hour, said he is he's in full of anticipation of yes. what the Bill's going to say. I only invite Bill in when there's been a Trump indictment, so he's in regularly uh, on the program. Uh, Becoming a regular. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bill, let's talk about these Georgia indictments now that were uh, sent down by the uh, district attorney there. Yeah. Um, Fannie Willis. It, Fannie or Fannie. I've heard everyone pronounce her name different ways. So either way. But there's uh, Trump and 18 others named in these indictments. It's a, it's a whopper. It's a, I mean, I read it and just was, wow, this is something. I mean, first of all, the indictment in, the indictments in Georgia is totally different than the indictments in West Virginia or the federal indictments, certainly. I mean, one of the first things I noticed was just incredible to me. They list, they list the members of the grand jury in the, in the pages of the document. Which is is that unusual? <laughs> yes, highly unusual. That's usually pretty secret information as to you know who's in a grand jury. But well, who would make? That's obviously not a mistake. No, that's a state. That's just apparently that's the way they do it in Georgia. Oh, okay. um, the other thing, obviously, is the um, the number of people. Not only eighteen co defendants, in, including Donald Trump, but thirty unindicted co conspirators. So this is a much broader um, attempt to charge uh, criminal violations than even the, the most recent January 6th federal indictment uh, that was brought in D.C. So um, much different. Obviously, the, the, the big headline is that it's a, it involves the RICO statute, uh, Racketeer Influenced Corrupt Organizations Act, um, long name for RICO. Typically associated with bringing mobsters down. True. Federal, federal started it, and that's the kind of thing that they, um, they did. And, you know, I'll give you an example of what, because people say, well, why RICO instead of just conspiracy? And, and conspiracy is, you know, we talked about this last time, Rob, that you and I decide we're going to rob a bank. We're going to do certain things to rob the bank. We Two people uh, agreeing to commit a crime, it's conspiracy. And a RICO enterprise or a RICO, a RICO charge involves more than just the conspiracy. Uh, Let's, for instance, say the easiest situation is like a gang, and there've been lots of gangs, gang activity prosecuted in this area. And let's say it's a drug deal. Um, in a conspiracy, you can you can offer witnesses and provide testimony about the drug deal, about where you bought the drugs, about where you sold the drugs, about you had a gun when you're selling the drugs, and those kinds of things. But if you want to bring all of the gang's activities, like they also strip cars, and they they engage in sex trafficking, and they do this and they do that, these various other things, which you normally couldn't get in talk about in just a conspiracy case um, now it becomes an enterprise so you're charging you, all of that conduct comes into play and um, it becomes a much more broadened um, criminal activity I will say this primary difference between Georgia and the federal system is that the federal system requires two specific kinds of acts in order to allow a RICO charge to be made and there's a very limited number of things, murder, kidnapping, drug dealing, a variety. There's, there's you know, a dozen or two dozen or so of those things. In Georgia, I mean, it must be 100 possible acts that can comprise a RICO statute. It's crazy. And the most notable one in this, do, these documents are lying to a state official. Lying to a state official is a crime in Georgia. And it's there's dozens of examples of where it's alleged that state officials will lie to, which makes up the conspiracy. They don't have to prove an enterprise in Georgia, unlike federal court. It's just a group of people doing common cause for uh, criminal activities. How will this work timing-wise with the federal <laughs> indictments? Well, that's really interesting. Uh, the prosecutor in Georgia said that she would be, she wants to try this case in six months. I can't see that possibly happening. I'm not sure it happens with a single defendant, let alone 19 de or 18 defendants. Um, and you have an ongoing federal case in D.C. that is operating allegedly on a similar time frame. Um, it has all kinds of potential problems uh, from a timing standpoint to do that. I mean, if I'm a now, I mean, if I'm the feds, I'm pretty upset. It make, made my life much more complicated because my witnesses who are not indicted in my um, um, 
charges, and I was going to call as a witness, and now they're charged in Georgia. And you know what they're doing when they arrive in federal court? I'm taking the Fifth Amendment because I'm under penalty of, of a crime in Georgia. So I'm not testifying. Okay? So that's... That, that's a so what you're saying is obstacle. there was not a lot of communication it then. Didn't, <laughs> well, they're totally independent authorities, sure, and, and uh, sure. you know that happens. But yeah, I mean, it, it's that's why, from a timing standpoint, um, it's really interesting. I mean, obviously, she does not want to try 18 defendants. Um, she wants some of these folks to plead up, plead guilty, and become voluntary witnesses. Really? We'll, we'll see if that happens. Bill, there's phenomenal complexity with this one of the complexities emerged yesterday that there are grounds for trump and probably some others to go from state court to federal court and not everybody would qualify but trump probably would qualify for this as would meadows uh if they do shift it to federal court the fact that federal court under RICO allows far fewer provisions in the state court. Would that mean that these provisions, be, these charges would be dropped? No, I don't think so. They're totally independent. There's no going to federal court on these RICO charges. There's no, I mean, they're in state court. That's where they're going to be. But they're, my impression, reading, uh, reading and watching the news last night, is that there is there is there are good legitimate grounds to shift to a federal court. The Georgia case? Yes, yeah, yes, that's... yes. Uh, because they, there are certain things because uh, the, um, the majority of the actions taken was while Trump was still president. Mm -hmm. That puts him in a very unique category, as does Mark Meadows. He's in a unique category. Uh, they, and they feel that they would be able to go to uh, federal court, which would do two things. One, it would could move to a, uh, take it out of Cobb County, which is very anti-Trump, for the jury pool, the second thing it would do is probably get a suite of uh, potential judges, some of which are, I think, about four or five of that uh, judge pool that were appointed by Trump. Yeah, I'm not familiar with any provision that would allow a state criminal case to be transferred or, in the civil context, removed to federal court. Um, that would be, I mean, he may be charged separately in federal court. He may have appeal rights relating to federal issues like the ones you mentioned. Um, that the state court would have to consider, and ultimately he may appeal to a federal court if, in fact, convicted in Georgia. But that's uh, that's where that would stand. So I don't see that happening uh, one way or the other. Maria. So it's, as, as Bill alluded to, it's so complicated that you've got all of the stuff in D.C. and all of the stuff in Georgia and, you know, kind of for the the average viewer, reader, or whatever, how do you even sort it all out? And certainly um, from the legal perspective, what comes first um, and, and where from here do we go? Well, courts generally cooperate. I mean, they, they, there's, there's going to be meetings. There's going to be some discussions about what should go first amongst the prosecutors. They'll try to coordinate with each other now uh, to some extent. Um, you know, my general theory has always been, even as a prosecutor, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the notion of making cases so complicated like mm -hmm. this Georgia one, because the more complicated it is, the more chance reasonable doubt gets sown in by a good defense lawyer. And if you so, start sowing reasonable doubt on some of the small things, it becomes a nightmare for a prosecutor, because that's all you need is a little bit of reasonable doubt, not a lot. Uh, so that's why I've always thought that, like, for instance, the mar lago case is the easiest case. That's the one that should be tried first because okay. it is like, I mean, limited witnesses, limited uh, charges, straightforward. If I'm the feds, that's what the one I want to try first. Alonzo. So, I mean, I, I have a lot to say, you know, my opinion, but I'm we have Bill here, so I'm, I love to ask questions. Uh, but I guess my very first question would be along the lines of, uh, what does this RICO case um, like signify? Like, is this a legal theory? Is this is this like you know adventurism? Did you, like, in your opinion, um, with the actual charges that Trump is falling under? No, it's a statute. I mean, there there are, there are laws. I mean, Georgia has a, several states have their own RICO laws, primarily based upon the federal statute that's been in existence, I think, since the early '80s, um, perhaps earlier than that. Um, now, some of the states have significantly broadened those laws, like Georgia has. Um, so it's a different tool in the toolbox, so to speak, 
for prosecutors. It's not that often used because it is complicated because you don't really have to do it um, to get what you want. If you want to get a 20 year sentence for somebody, excuse me, doing something, a simple conspiracy may do it for you or just the general charge. So RICO adds complications to things, but it, to the benefit of the prosecutors, they get to introduce evidence that they would not otherwise be able to introduce in a normal conspiracy or a simpler case. So the RICO is the umbrella on the actual conspiracy charges. So uh, the first... Uh, the RICO's like conspiracy on steroids. Okay. Think of it that so way. So the, the <laughs> first conspiracy charge on there is what? The solicitation of uh, the elected officials, right? It was him asking... Uh, to decertify the election or whatever legal means um, were used to uh, basically stop the, the actual count and work on the electors there in Georgia. That's the first um, solicitation. Do you think that that shows some type of impropriety when he asks uh, that he asked to decertify the election and for uh, you to do it within any legal means? Yeah, I think... Um it's important to recognize that the the overt acts, which is what you're talking about, constitute what makes up the RICO um, case in, in this indictment. Uh, so all of the acts combined, not one more important than the other, all of the acts combined make up the activities associated with the quote-unquote criminal enterprise. So, for instance, they have a whole thing on the um, false statements to um, the uh, Mr. Raffensperger, who is the, I guess, the Secretary of State in Georgia, uh, post-election, you got to find me these votes, blah, 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 and they go through paragraph by subparagraph on everything that was said. As, but as I indicated earlier, lying to a um, state official in the performance of their duties in and of itself is a crime. It also makes up one of the acts of the RICO charge. So um, all of those lies, and again, you have to prove it's a lie. We've had this discussion before. If he truly believed it wasn't a lie and um, he was just trying to get to the bottom of a, what he considered to be a bad a bad election system, uh, that's one thing. But if, if, in fact, they can prove there are lies, those are those are criminal charges in and of themselves and make up the RICO counts. So the, dozens and dozens of not only lies by him, according to the indictment, but lies by his um, uh, subordinates and co-conspirators. Co Bill, these charges may be equal in the eyes, of, in the legal profession, the eyes of the lawyers, uh, but they're not equal in the eyes of the public. Uh, you've certainly put one out that a lot of us would sit back and say that's incredulous. Why would they charge just because lying to a, the, uh, to a, a government official? Are there other charges that would, that we would view as more substantive and more more striking than lying to a government official? Well, we'll just take the Raffensperger one, the one that I think kind of goes beyond just the lying. And by the way, I find it amusing or somewhat ironic that apparently it's a crime to lie to a public official, but a public official can lie to you on a regular yeah. basis and not be charged with anything. <laughs> like now, every day? I mean, just, I find that, I find that fairly amusing. Have a biscuit, it'll feel better. <laughs> yeah. okay, just a second. But for, what, to answer Bill's question is that, let's say, okay, lying to the Secretary of State about, oh, we believe um, these ballots weren't counted or whatever the case may be. Now, where it gets dicier is when he says, if you don't do this, I'm going to have you criminally prosecuted. Okay. Did he say that? Yeah, that's okay. that's the well, that's okay. the allegation. Yeah. I haven't heard the okay. tape. Okay. Apparently, this you know this is like a 30 minute conversation, so we have snippets yeah. of conversation. Mm -hmm. So I want to put it in context. But at least the the allegation, not only in this indictment but the others, that uh, the threat was made for. We're gonna if you don't do this, we're gonna find a way to prosecute you. And um, and he made some other very what, specific. What is the specific crime in that statement, Bill? Uh, which which statement? If you don't do this, we're going to criminally prosecute you. Well, that would be the threat. That's that's not that would not necessarily be a lie. That would be. Correct. I'm using my power in my position to, to. I'm intimidating you as a witness, as a state official, to do but what I'm asking if, you to if, do. If I believe the votes were corrupted in Georgia, mm -hmm. and I say to you, listen, I need you to find me these however many votes that I need to win Georgia because I believe I've been cheated. Can you investigate this? and find these votes I believe I rightfully have coming to me. You know, that's the right thing to do at your job as a constitutional officer. If you don't do it, you'll be criminally prosecuted. It, 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 that could also be construed as a statement of fact for you not doing your job. Words mean things, and it's all a matter of context. Right. So I agree. 
that there there are ways around to make that argument appear rational and reasonable. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, he he may also accuse you know some of these poll workers specifically by name stuffing ballot boxes. Yes, those are you better better have some proof. Yeah, and, and yeah. he 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 hurt a couple of people's lives as you yes. saw in the testimony of yes. a few you, you can, know can substantiated the claims. Can the consequences of his claim, I'm talking about the two uh, poll workers and the fact that they they felt their lives were in jeopardy and they their social standing was destroyed and all that. Can the consequences come into play during the hearing? I don't think so. I mean I, yeah. I mean I'm not the judge, but yeah. the, the the stuff with respect to I fe- feared for my life, I think that's kind of irrelevant probably won't be admissible i don't see it as a big deal i'm not saying it's i don't want to take anything away from people who have felt fear or, you know that didn't i'm not sure. saying those emotions weren't real but from an evidentiary standpoint i'm not sure how that comes in so as a former prosecutor <laughs> what was your first impression when and obviously you have everything right there um of what happened um in georgia i don't have everything right here we don't have enough room in this room for everything to have. Okay, yeah, have that's everything. true. I, you, but, okay, you have the Cliff you know, Notes version. Yeah, I have the Cliff Notes version. Um, well, my first reaction was, and speaking of Mr. Ferretti, he's in Georgia, so he's obviously going to yeah. – he's already probably an expert on Georgia law, so he should probably call in and, and give us uh, his impression. I think Joe is helping her run yeah, copies. That's exactly yeah. probably right. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, but um, I, I think the breadth, the whole breadth of the thing with the number of people indicted and the coke and the – Unindicted co-conspirators. This goes. This is, doesn't go to Trump itself. This goes to Trump and all of his friends. That's what it goes to. And the breadth of the RICO statute in, um, you know, pretty ingenious from a prosecutor's standpoint to use that. Um, whether it's going to fly or not in the end, I'm not sure. But the um, the breadth of it and the scope of the RICO statute in Georgia was astounding to me because I I done said some limited experience with federal RICO. And I remember thinking, God, this is pretty hard to prove. I'm not sure I want to. Why am I looking at this? Let's go to something simpler. Mm-hmm. But it's a lot simpler in Georgia. We have about a minute and a half uh, left here, Bill. Uh, I, I read, by the way, that I guess the RICO statutes were passed under the Nixon administration. Okay. And the very first official to be uh, indicted on a RICO statute was Nixon's attorney general. <laughs> and then they were going to use that against Nixon. So it's kind of ironic that that's – and then it kind of no, – nothing happened for like another 20 years until they figured out they could use it against the, the mob. Uh, and Giuliani was a big part of that too. And now well, he's named in this. Well, that's right. right. Be careful what you wish for. He's like the second or third name after Meadows and Trump that's, yes. uh, that's on this. So this is kind of all fascinating stuff. Ab- absolutely. How it comes around. Hey, uh, 30 seconds. If this is like neck and neck for who's going to go first, do the feds trump the states? Um I've seen this battle before. Feds, state don't like doesn't don't like the feds telling them what to do. Trust me, and I'm sure, <laughs> I know the feds don't like the states tell, trying to tell them what to do. So this is going to be a discussion. I'm sure many discussions uh, from a strategy standpoint of what's going to go first. Uh, again, I would have my preferences. Uh, go easy uh, first, and get then what see, you can. get what you can, and then see where everything goes. 